anyway, we've had a lot of good speakers the last two days. And, and of course, everything, it's on everybody's mind. You know, we had come off of this really two years of really wet springs and, and this kind of weather and how are we going to get ready. And some of us had uh, prevented planting acres last year. And uh, how's that play into the overall soil health equation? And uh, I guess so I'm going to, I'm going to, it's two, kind of two facets. There's some immediate strategies we'll talk about for this spring a little bit, and then there's some overarching strategies is how we're going to uh, instill some function back to our soils so that we're, we've got a resilient cropping system for these kinds of events that seem to be the new normal. So um, anybody that knows me, I always start off with our soil health definition. And I've highlighted key words about soil health because some of you are new to the soil health or there's a lot of soil health in the newspapers. When, when we talk about soil health, some, to some people that sounds kind of like foo-foo, you know, that's, well, that's feel good, that makes, that's nice that you're talking about soil health. But what we're talking about is real soil function improvements. And uh, some of us have gotten a little complacent over the years that well, you know, it rained two inches last night. What are you going to do? You know, it's all ponded up. What are you going to do? Two inches of rain. Well, what you're going to do is you're going to do your very best to regenerate soil function so that when those raindrops hit, we have infiltration, true infiltration from water stable aggregates at the surface. Aggregate stability is back in that soil so that wherever that raindrop lands, it has a chance to go into the matrix of the soil right there. That doesn't mean run across the surface, pick up a bunch of phosphorus fertilizer, and then go down a crack in the soil to a tile, right? That's preferential flow. I'm talking about real infiltration uh, and real aggregate stability is what we're really talking about. Those are the key, some key indicators that your soil health is improving, okay? So we talked about that a little bit yesterday, and we've had some really good information this morning. And that, so that function is tied to the living ecosystem. That's why we've... We've tried to get several really good biology type speakers to talk to you. And so we're educating ourselves on the important biology, the important organisms that, that help are part of that living ecosystem, that they really are the only ones that are going to regenerate soil function. So if we don't have a strategy for those, if we don't if our management system isn't complementing the living ecosystem and 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 taking advantage of that, then then we're going to have a hard time re rebuilding that soil function and that, you know, that, that resilience that we all need, okay? So some of those functions that we talk a lot about, I just, I'll just, nutrient cycling, that's a generic term that everybody uses loosely, but the reality is what that means is most nutrients that wind up in the plant come from the soil, not from what we apply. Did everybody know that? The soil, nature intended for soil to be the supplier of nutrients, and that means the biology in the soil supplies the nutrients. And so when we talk about nutrient cycling, what we're meaning is nutrients are assimilated into bodies of organisms. Those organisms go through their life cycle, eating, uh, sleeping, pooping, uh, reproducing, all this kind of stuff, and then they cycle it, they give it back in plant available nutrients. But the more long chain, especially organisms that we can have, that's why we talked about you know, beneficial funguses here this morning. Uh, the more long chain, the better, the longer, the, the more spoon feeding that that cycling is. So when we talk about cycling, it's, you know, it just, everybody throws that out, yeah, improve nutrient cycling. What that really means is it, it, it's moving, nutrients are moving through organisms, assimilating, being part of their body for at least a period of time, and then they come back out uh, the way really nature intended to, to then become uh, uh, food for that next plant, for that crop, okay? So it's so, so nutrient cycling. Water infiltration is one of the really key functions that our soil, we've got to get that back, okay? If we're going to have this kind of weather, we've got to have infiltration, and then once it gets in there, it's got to have enough aggregate stability and pore space to hold an organic matter. Remember the sponge that, that Shore did, the, the sponges? We've got to have more sponges in the soil then to hold the water and make more water available to plants longer and, and extend that season before stress, drought stress kicks in, okay? So those are, those are really key. And then of course, filtering, if we've got active carbon in the soil, active carbon is a great filter, a great buffering agent from a water quality standpoint. And we've already talked several times with the, the compaction discussion that, that good aggregate stability 
and combine that with lots of more living roots will actually hold up our equipment. It won't cause major harvest issues and major rutting and all this kind of stuff. So those are key functions that's tied to soil health, okay? So I don't want to belabor that point. I always put up the, the four key functions. These are management principles that are in the back of your mind with every operation. Okay, these have to be in the back of your mind. They fit wherever you're at in the country or the world. They, they fit whatever your operation is, whatever your crop rotation is. If you have these in the back of your mind, you're going to complement that living ecosystem, right? And then you're going to start getting function back. So the minimize disturbance, maximize soil cover. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. You've heard these before. Jim covered them yes, yesterday. Maximize biodiversity, and if that maximizing biodiversity, if it's practical for you to integrate livestock on that farm, then that's a good thing too. But you've got to do that well also. Not just any old grazing system, but you've got to graze it wisely, to, and that adds to your biodiversity, but then continuous living roots also is feeding more organisms in the soil, okay, and feeding them longer. Okay, so that's important principles to keep in the back of your mind. If we do that, then we're going to be uh, improving organic matter, improving aggregate stability, and, and improving water infiltration, all these things that we, we are trying to measure and, and track our progress with, that we want to see all these things, and all, notice all the ings, these are going up, these are improving, these are, these are, these are getting better, and then when, as we're doing that, then we're building resilience into our cropping system, okay? So too much water, let's, let's talk about that for just a second. Uh, it seems to be kind of a regular event that we're getting too much of the water sometime, whether it's early spring, middle of the growing season. You know, if we look at uh, 2015, uh, 2015, the whole Corn Belt, Eastern Corn Belt, all the way across the Corn Belt, we were getting way too much water all the way through June. And, and uh, you know, we had a lot of, a lot of difficult crop, uh, crop growth and crop production issues that, that went along with that. If you look at then May and June of last year, you know, it started out west, but then really in June, we still were getting way over the normal amount of rain, and you guys were hit as hard as anybody right up here with that. So if we have crops, you know, if we have that kind of situation and we have a soil that's not at full function, and, and I know everybody's sitting here going, you know, with that much rain, how am I going to have a crop? If I, but if you got a crop planted, a lot of the crops were looking like that. And you can see, though, within any given field, parts of the field are functioning higher than others. Parts of the field can take this better than others. Look at the end rows. Are they yellower or greener? Why would they be yellower? We've got compaction there. We've got, we've got poor soil function a lot of times in, in different parts of the field. If you look at, at, at closer at some of these, you can see wheel tracks through the field. You, you know, that crop is going to tell you whether the soil is functioning very well. Uh, if you look all the way to the left there, though, there's, a, there's an area that's going up and down, but it's dark green all the way. And if you followed that back out to the edge of the road, what might I find there? It's not tile. That'd be my first guess, though. What else might be out here next to the road that gives me an indication of what happened on that dark green strip on the left side? There's a concrete fence post right here, an old property line concrete fence post, right? So that was a fence row. Anybody heard me talk about the fence row effect? Remember those four principles that I had? Those of you that've got yield monitors, you've seen this if you've taken an old fence row out, right? And you use the yield monitor across there. What about what do we know about a fence row that's been in fence row for a long time? Huh? It's got more organic matter there, right? Better aggregate stability. What's driving that from a management standpoint? Remember my four principles? Have have those fence rows had adequate cover? Have they had very much disturbance, diversity, continuous living roots? And that then gives you aggregate stability, more organic matter. It gives you soil function. And no matter how bad the weather is, certain parts of the field, if you have high-functioning soil, can take are far more resilient to this. And that's our ultimate goal, right? So we want that fence row effect across the entire farm. 
And the beauty is we now know how to manage for that, okay? So we know how to manage for that. So keep that fence row in mind as, as, you're think, as I talk through some of these things and kind of think about that fence row effect and how can we manage for that across the entire farm. I threw this up there just, in, just so you know, just because we have too much water in one part of the season doesn't mean it's going to continue. What's worse than having a really, really wet June? A really, really hot, dry July and August after a really, really wet June, right? That's what we had. We had about five weeks in our part of the world. I'm, I'm actually uh, right there in, in central, south, southwest central uh, uh, Indiana is where our farm is, and we had about five weeks with no measurable rainfall right after the last big rain that happened the first week of July there, right at the end of June and Ju the first week of July. So we went from really wet, saturated to nothing, you know, and, and so we were all like, man, we're, you know, everybody says you, what you want is a dry June to get good roots. If you got a wet June, you have no roots. If you have no roots, then it turns dry in July. That's bad, right? High soil function will carry in a lot of places. Most of the folks in that west central part of the area, we've probably got about a 300,000 area, acre area there that's been in long-term no-till since the mid early 90s and, and has been in cover crops in, since the mid uh, early 2000s. And so we have a whole big area there of pretty high functioning soils in that part of the world and we all get together. And this was, after this season, we were expecting almost nothing and when the combine started to roll, we had a lot of actual <laughs> record-breaking yields. I don't even want to tell people that had prevented planting that. I'm embarrassed to say that, but the, the soil was able to take that kind of scenario, and they, they, we wound up with some really, really good yields in our area, mostly because we have just a big core group of people that have high-functioning soils. And, and so, so it gives us confidence to talk about some of the strategies that, that we talk about that. It's already been said at, at numerous uh, presentations, fallow corn syndrome. If we're going to have prevented planting, doing tillage all summer long keeps the biology out. You're not feeding anything for a long period of time. And so, so that's going to be not good habitat for biological organisms. So you're, it's going to be rough on some of the beneficial fungi. It's going to be, uh, uh, be rough on some of the beneficial bacteria, protozoa, and other microbes, especially aerobic microbes that are really beneficial to us, okay? So, so in that scenario, at the very first opportunity, of course, we would want to get a living root back on there if at all possible. Uh, but we've got a lot of fields, as I drove across coming over here today, we've got a lot of fields that have obviously just been kept bare all ever since the flooding early, and then we, we kept it with tillage, kept it bare all summer long. So there was a session over there that talked about fallow corn syndrome and things like that. I didn't get, didn't get to go to it. I hope I'm not contradicting what they said, but, but, but we, we haven't had any host roots for a lot of the beneficial organisms, so especially like rhizobium bacteria uh, has not had a host now for a long time. The, the uh, AMF fungi, the, the, or the uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, has not had a host for a long time now. And so phosphorus delivery, you'll have purple corn syndrome and some things like that in some of those situations can happen. And so uh, it would be one of those places from a strategy standpoint if you had those folks that even maybe now, spring seeding something to jumpstart some biology, uh, spring seed some oats or get something growing out there, even knowing you're going to kill them in a few weeks, you'd be amazed sometimes how much growth you get to jumpstart the system. Might help stimulate some of that bacteria. This might be a place to consider some inoculants, some of the liquid inoculants, whether it's, if you're going to do mycorrhizal fungi, I always tell you, if you're going to inoculate for that, Make absolutely sure that whoever's selling that to you has, can, can validate that the strains that are in there are beneficial to your corn and beans. Don't get something that, that is potentially parasitic to, to your corn plant or bean plant or whatever you're getting ready. So, so there's, you need to know a little bit about some of those. But if you're planting soybeans in this situation, this would be the place I'd, I'd if I don't, if you don't normally inoculate your beans with the rhizobium, I'd probably do that this year. This would be the season to do those kinds of things, probably if you were coming off of a fallow, a continuous fallow kind of a system, okay? 
And there's, there's quite a bit of that around. I've seen, uh, I drove past a lot of fields that looks like that's just probably been bare soil all summer, last summer and all fall and then all winter. So there'd be some opportunities to do those kind of things for this, this spring. While I'm here, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these organisms just from a slightly different perspective than some of the other presenters. And, and I, I like to look at these as functional groups. You know, there's, there's kind of three functional groups that we teach when we have our, our soil health training in, in, in NRCS. Uh, we talk about, you know, the, the ecosystem engineers. That's some of those bigger ones that are moving things around. They're actually manipulating their environment. Uh, they're earthworms, some of those... Uh, you know, roly polies and 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 uh, uh, millipedes and things like that. Uh, they're actually they're actually uh, moving around and changing their environment. There's biological regulators. There's biochemical engineers, and probably the ones that you know when we're talking about nutrient cycling and things like that. Those biochemical engineers are critical. That's the bacteria and the fungi and and some of those things that that I'll probably spend a little more time on that. But there are different groups of biology that we want to try to get they all do a purpose they all serve a function so so we want to have a system that 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 is beneficial to all of those if at all possible so here's some of those ecosystem engineers they're the ones that are helping restore some of the pore space in the soil they're crawling around they're li they're big enough that they're actually opening up soil and carrying out their life cycle making nice little deposits of of nutrients along the way and things like that so earthworms are the ones that come to mind but the millipedes and roly polies and all of those kinds of things they're out there also processing larger size uh, organic matter pieces and things like that moving them down into the soil and and uh, moving nutrients around and things so so they're, they're an important group, uh, but uh, they're the ones that are probably most affected by tillage. And if they've been tilled all summer long, you've really hurt their, their habitat the, uh, a lot, you know. So um, then you've got the chemical, the processors, you know. And, and so these are the ones that I think, you know, uh, have a lot to do with, you know, they're the real drivers of, of energy and, and, and deliverers of nutrients and cyclers that, that help with all those nutrient cycles. When a nutrient specialist tells you, talks, use words like the soil's ability to deliver nutrients, the soil's ability to, to, to supply nutrients, they're talking about these folks. It, yes, it's, it's, it's your amount of nutrients that's in the soil, but most soils, you know, if you think about how much phosphorus is just in the... T what, does anybody remember when Ray Weil was over here? What did he say? Our soil has probably 3,500 pounds of phosphorus in the top, you know, six or eight inches. But it's these guys that make it available. It's these folks that make it available. And so when we're talking about the soil's ability to deliver, we're talking about these folks right here. So... This is really critical, but they've got to have a habitat if they're going to do that process, do that job for us. And we've got some biological regulators that are important out there, too. We think of nematodes, ooh, they're bad, right? Well, most of them are good, actually. Most of them are good. Most of them are actually helping us with a lot of important jobs out there, uh, especially regulating the populations of the bad organisms. They're really good at helping us keep everybody in check, you know. So... So we want to have a habitat for those two when we talk about the bio biology in the soil. So we got those three kind of functional groups that we talk about. This is not a total biology class, so we're not, I'm not going to dive into it. There's better people to do that than I am. But just know that we have to have a management system that, that allows them to do their job. And, and so that's when we talk about disturbance. That's when we talk about those four principles. That's why they're important. Okay. Most of those organisms have the, you know, the Goldilocks syndrome. They, you know, they, they like things just like we do, right, right where we want it. You know, we like we like our pH where it is. We like our temperature where it is. Our oxygen where, where we like it, and and water and all those kinds of things. So they do too. And so one of the things that happens in a fallow situation or in a prevented plant where we have really saturated soils for a long time is a lot of these have had their, their you know, notice that they want an aerated, you know, and they want water, they want food. If, they, if we 
not been able to supply food and air to a lot of those organisms, then, then it's why we need to jumpstart the system and get it back as fast as we possibly can. Okay? Uh, most of these organisms have hot spots where they're, where they're going to proliferate. And so, you know, when we're talking about building soil organic matter, everybody immediately thinks that the, the carbon is all in, within the plant. You know, we're, we measure plant biomass to estimate how much carbon we're going to actually get. But anybody was here last year, did you hear, remember Christine Nichols talked about the liquid carbon pathway? What was she referring to? This is a huge part of the overall carbon that we're able to build. If the plant is providing more liquid carbon, more food stuff, then the populations of these that live right along the rhizosphere is, is really, really a, an important place. And that will, that will add, uh, you know, every benefit, carbon benefit you get from the root or for the carbon that's in the plant, you can almost double that by what's growing along the plant and making use of that liquid carbon that's being supplied by the, by the plant roots, okay? So all carbon is not in the plant. So we actually get a lot, we can actually sequester a lot more carbon if we consider, and, and we'll measure a lot more carbon if we consider the, the, that uh, livestock that's living along the roots, living along the roots. So, that, so that's how we get more organic matter than some of the math would indicate we could because that's a hard one to measure exactly how much we're going to get, okay? So, so the rhizosphere is critical, though. That's the number one hot spot if we're wanting to build biology back. we got to have a, a... And the rhizosphere is that area along the root, right? Along the living root. If you don't have the living root, you don't have the rhizosphere. If you do a whole bunch of tillage, you mess up the rhizosphere so the rhizosphere doesn't stay in, in, in a continuous uh, uh, habitat. Okay, so the things that, 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 that the key organisms that live there, uh, bacteria is of course most numerous, bacteria is the is most numerous of anything in the soil, but, but the, the uh, you know, two, two to five percent of soil organic matter, but there was, that, that bacteria is responsible for 90 percent of the energy flow, and that's that soil's ability to provide nutrients when the, then the folks are talking about that. So that's a real, a really key group of you know uh, of, of organisms that we need to account for. However, a harder one to manage for are possibly the the, the fungi. And so, you know, we talk about saprophytic uh, mycorrhiza, and, and now I'm going to add I'm going to add some of the new fungi that we've learned about uh, today. So, some of them are pathogenic. We 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 can kind of regulate those with some of those regulators I talked about. The protozoa and nematodes will help regulate those. But those are all the key organisms that want to associate and want to live in that rhizosphere. So having that living root, that's why we talk about the living root. Um, fixing bacteria is an important group, you know, uh, when we have legumes out there. Does everybody know that, uh, you know, we talked about that when the plant, you know, is, is sending exudates out, but if the plant doesn't need nitrogen, it doesn't necessarily send out the signals, it doesn't feed those organisms, doesn't give up resources unless it's going to get something in return. So if we have a high amount of nitrogen out there, these, these folks don't, uh, uh, they don't do as much fixing. And the most of the fixing that they do happens uh, when the roots are growing, when the roots are expanding, say the soybean roots are expanding, that's when they're, they're giving away more uh, resources to attract these, these organisms. As Soon as the soybean goes into reproductive mode, in their full-blown reproducting mode, nature doesn't give away many things at oppor inopportune times. So when it's time to make seed, we start getting stingier with what we're giving away. And so the bean actually, during a lot of pod fill, has already stopped getting a lot of nitrogen from uh, nodulation, and that's why some of these cover crops, when we plant beans in the cover crops, and then we get a, you know, we've got that mat of residue from the cover crops laying on the surface, and then we get maybe an August rain, a little August rain or September rain, 
that flush of nutrients that comes out of that comes at a very opportune time. So sometimes that's why that's a really good play uh, for, for, for some of these organisms like this because they've kind of given up uh, what they're giving, but that's, that's still needed by, by the soybeans. Soybeans require a lot of nitrogen, so I just threw that up there just because that's another one of those that in a really, really wet, saturated situation don't do as well. So I, I guess this would be a year I would inoculate soybeans, okay? And we've already had a pretty good discussion. I don't want to belabor it very much on, on the mycorrhizal fungi, but, but uh, uh, they have to have a living host. And so anytime we've got that continuous fallow or continuous situation without living roots, then, then we can have knocked that back a little bit too. So, so that's, we've, we've pretty much had good discussion on that though, so I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time on that. There comes a point in your presentation when it's just going <laughs> to slow down. I've been observing this whole clicker thing all week. <laughs> uh, let me get past some of these. That, I, I will just reiterate, though, we've got to build soil aggregates, and that, that, that mycorrhizal fungi, all of those beneficial fungi are so critical. Yeah, the roots will entangle and help build good soil aggregates and stuff, but boy, if we can get some of those longer chain microorganisms, the fungi and, and mycorrhiza and, and some of those, now we really start building stable aggregates that are, that are water stable aggregates and, and, and that, that is really important when we start building soil function. Okay, if we don't have, if we have a lot of, a lot of time without those bio biological organisms, then this is the kind of soil condition we can have the next year or, you know, we, we lose that soil structure and when we lose soil aggregate stability, then, then we're going to have soil that looks like that. And that, that is not a high functioning soil, okay? When, it, when the particles go into the water, you've a lot of times seen folks, and I've done them here, I think, the, the aggregate stability test, when we put two different chunks of soil in there and one explodes and the other one doesn't, the one that explodes, those soil particles turn into this on the surface then. And they do that very, very fast. They seal up even that first rain, but then the next rain's even worse. And the next rain's worse. And so, so that's, that's, that's how we get infiltration is if we restore aggregate stability and we don't have to put up with, with that right there. So, so the bottom line is, you know, the take home message is, is in prevented planting situations, yes, it's a bad deal. You're, you know, we don't, none of us want this. But the way to convert a bad situation into a good one is, is maybe not get out the plow, leave the plow parked. When in doubt, when you're trying to fix something, when in doubt, plant. Plant a, a diverse mix, that's an opportunity. Consider that an opportunity and after things finally dry out to get a diverse uh, cover crop mix out there. And then when you do that, you, start, you keep looking for opportunities, you know. And, and if there's a way to get one of those black and white opportunities out there on the land and take advantage of that cover crop, then that's great. You may not be able to get that done, but at least feed the microbes, at least feed the deer and the, and the voles and everything else in the, in the, in the, in the, on the landscape, you know. So they'll help process that uh, process all that carbon and, and, and start regenerating soil health there and soil function, okay? Let's talk uh, a few specifics, and the beauty is we'll use that crowdsourcing again. I've got some great people that I can call on and, and, and talk to here to get input on this, but if we got a cover crop planted and we've really got a lot of biomass out there to plant into, if we're going to be planting into cover crops, if you've been sold through this week that maybe I ought to start doing cover crops, we need to, there's some little tricks of the trade that as we move into spring here, we need to, we don't want to have any train wrecks, okay? So uh, right now is when uh, you want to be setting up your planter. Make sure your planter is capable of planting into that, okay? If you, if you don't have access to one, be thinking of ways that maybe some, some situations, if that cover crop gets really big, if it's another really wet spring and you're going to let that cover crop grow and pull moisture out, you're going to have a lot of biomass, maybe you need a way to get it on the ground. So a roller crimper or modify something that's in your tool shed. But, but now would be the time to start be thinking about that. Back to the planner, it, uh, it just occurred to me, we were having a discussion over, over the other way. 
your planter needs to have really good sharp discs, and, and you know, we've, we have those discussions. Bill Limkul, I saw him earlier, he always has, a lot of years he has a really good session on how to set up your planter and how to get, but we've got a lot of folks that talk about that. Make sure if you're going to be doing that, that you've got those in hand now. <laughs> because it, it may be too late. There's going to be a high demand because not as much is going to be maybe coming uh, uh, across the ocean to us, okay? So, so getting some of these parts for your planner, getting that done, is make sure you've got that done. I hope you've already ordered that or got it in hand, if at all possible, to get ready to plant through some of this. Uh, so and then be, be coming up with your strategy, your plan. How be, am I going to terminate earlier? What conditions would I be terminating early? And what conditions would I be terminating late? And everybody has talked, all the farmers that you've heard on the panels and everything, you've got to be a game time coach, right? You're going to read the season. If we're coming out here, what if we just received today the last rain before we get ready to plant? We've had some dry seasons, dry spells before, but that cover crop's growing like crazy. You'd be reading that and looking at the forecast and looking at the planting conditions. There's a point there where it's time to kill that cover crop, even if it's maybe a little earlier than you wanted to, to go ahead and not let it keep using water. That's only happened to me once in about 15 years. But, but there are years that, that you don't want that cover crop to just keep using water. Okay, There's, there are years that, that you want to read the season and go ahead and terminate and then kill it. More years than not, though, it's wet, and you're going you're gonna to be reading that cover crop. You're going to watch and, and, and knowing what your next crop is. In general, you would terminate earlier when in the, the cover crop is more vegetative ahead of corn and a little later ahead of beans. In general, that's a general statement, okay? And so there comes a point, though, at the height of, let's say it's cereal rye, when there comes a point when, let me see what my next... When, when, when that cover crop um, gets so big that you're going to be better off then to plant into it and then kill it afterwards. There, there starts becoming a lot of detrimental things that happens if you've got a lot of traffic out there ahead of, the, ahead of planting. Now you've got residue leaning different directions that can hang up on your planter a little more. You've got traffic patterns that you're trying to figure out what's happening if you don't have guidance equipment. Uh, it's, it's kind of nice when your cover crop gets, starts getting pretty big for the planting operation to be the very first thing. But, but once you plant, then it's really good to get it dead, and, and I mean brown dead. Because as the corn and soybean starts coming out of the ground, these plants actually see light waves and they see reflection off of green biomass. And it triggers hormones in them that, that changes them to to elongate, and they'll do that at the expense of setting ears, for example, in corn. So that's just something, I'll, I think I'll get into that here a little bit more. Uh, soil organic matter matters. I've already talked about that for the most part. I keep wandering away from the thing. But I want to I go back just a little bit and talk about those different pools of organic matter because it's the different pools and the new understanding of the different pools that, that affects soil function. When we talk about organic matter, we, think, we immediately think of that number. It's not a thing, right? But we think of it's a thing because it's that number on our, on our traditional soil test. That's just mostly the humus. That's stuff that's measured loss on ignition. That's, that's, that's not all of the pools of organic matter. So the new, the new understanding of organic matter that's actually in, in college textbooks, there's the 15th edition of Weil and Brady, uh, that's in most of college uh, soils courses now. Uh, it's got a whole new chapter on organic matter. And so we have to understand that all of this is part of the organic matter. And there's two distinct groups, labile organic matter and humus. But the, uh, within the labile, that's what's actually providing a lot of soil function, okay? Living biomass, it's everything from the living organisms to the free and uh, 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 identifiable plant material to degraded, slightly broken down. That you can't really tell what it is, but you can tell it's recently been something living, uh, organic matter. And then and it's those, those dissolved, those, that liquid pathway that, that Christine Jones talks about, that living, that, that liquid carbon pathway that, that provides a lot of soil function out there. Okay, so you've got all these, all these uh, 
different pools. So when we think about organic matter, I want you to start thinking about that a little differently because soil function improves with all of these pools of organic matter. And, and you have to have the labile and organic, the, 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 the new organic matter before you can get the old stable organic matter, okay? You gotta start somewhere. And, and you'll have a lot of that coming on and improving long before it'll show up on your, your regular soil test, okay? So we're gonna have not just a, a protective blanket, but an active blanket. Uh, Jerry Hatfield talked about that a lot, how much more improved uh, soil function you get from an active protective blanket that feeds, not only protects, but feeds, okay? So let me get through, you've seen some of these practices. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna jump into the fact that, that in nature, seldom is like a cover a good thing. And so that was even more evident. I, I was talked into going down to uh, south of Cancun with my wife on vacation. I had some friends set up a deal and we went. And uh, I, it was become very evident to me that in nature, uh, lack of cover is seldom a good thing. However, sometimes it's an okay thing, but I can tell you that on this old boy, lack of cover was not a good thing, okay? So, so in nature, uh, we want to have some cover. Um, so strategically speaking, uh, I'll jump into this just a little bit, but just in general, coming into the spring or coming into a, a time when maybe we're going to start strategizing over cover crops, um, ahead of corn, we're, this cover crop and getting cover and getting, you know, matching up the biology and feeding biology, we, feed, we need to feed it differently ahead of corn versus ahead of beans, if at all possible. Ahead of corn, we need to think of high protein because we want nitrogen to cycle a little quicker. Right, so we're thinking high protein. So that means uh, more vegetative type cover crop plants, more legumes if at all possible to get that in the rotation. That's why Dave does such a good job after wheat, he can grow a lot more legumes ahead of that corn plant. That works really well because you're, now you're complementing the next crop in the rotation. Ahead of soybeans, you can have a high carbon cover crop because the beans are going to fix nitrogen even faster, they'll start nodulating faster in a nitrogen deficient environment. Follow me strategically. So you're, you're having a different strategy ahead of corn than have out of beans. Your management may be slightly different. You want to complement what's next if you're going to have, have a good outcome. Okay. Let's talk about just managing that cover, planting green a little bit here. And, and this is where I would welcome uh, input from the audience who have done this for quite a while. I've done it for quite a while. But planting green can mean a lot of things. In some of those years, like the one that I show you up there in April 24th, planting green, that was one of those years that was, gosh, it was just drying out. It was getting drier, getting drier, getting drier, and it's, at some point you just got to pull the trigger and plant and then kill that cover crop because it's using water that you don't know if it's when your last rain comes. So planting green can be, it, it can be kind of short stuff that you're planting green into. And then in a really wet year, like last year, uh, May 22nd was the very first time you could get in the field. I mean, it was the first time. And so first time you can get into the field, you don't want to be out there running around with a sprayer or fertilizer buggy, you plant. And then you, you try to kill it right after that. One thing you do not want to do, and it's been said by f several of the panelists and farmers, is, is you don't want a kind of dead cover crop to plant into. If you kill it a few days before your, you know, a week before, then maybe you get a slight small rain on it. The worst thing you can try to plant into uh, is, is, is a half dead cover crop that, that just turns to rubber and and wet rope that you're trying to plant into. It wants to wrap on everything. Now you can't close your seed slot. You know, bad things happen when you're planting into a half dead cover crop, especially a half dead wet cover crop. And uh, this was actually one. <laughs> we we at, at, at Purdue, we have a diagnostic training. I know Carrie's been to it. We have a diagnostic training for our, a lot of our employees and for our C CCAs, our, our, a soil health diagnostic training at Purdue at their diagnostic lab. And we, we actually planned this just to, so we can show what happens to the corn planter. We killed that cover crop in the middle slot. They've got a white corn planter there at the diagnostic lab. 
and you can't really see it there, but it's got starter fertilizer knives and, and it's a coulter knife combination. And that coulter was scooting through the field. It was so locked up with that wet rubbery cover crop that we had purposefully killed like, like a, a, week, a week before and then we had a rain on it and stuff. And so, so but that happens a lot. You get a lot of calls on, on things like that. That's just not the time to manage that. You gotta be a game time coach. When it gets that big, just, just plant in it and then kill it. If you are gonna kill it early though, make sure you've got enough time to kill it early enough that it's crispy, you know. Uh, you, you want to make sure you've got a weather forecast that's favorable enough that that, that, that cover crop's going to be crispy before you plant into it, okay? And so planting green can be a little scary to a new person. This is what happens in a very short period of time. You can kind of see it growing and progressing. It's all one, one location. And then finally you get to plant into it. But the good news is that cover will be good quail cover. You know, the bird dog there. <laughs> At least all that extra cover is good. But, but you know, even in that situation, that, that got clear up big head high cereal rye. You saw what, a, what the drill ran into, but, but that's still 65 bushel beans. You know, so, so it's not an absolute train wreck if you're planting beans, planting green into even big cereal rye. It's not a, not a train wreck, and that's why we say, one of your first operations if you're moving into this is plant cereal rye first after corn because planting beans into that is, is, is usually an okay thing. You, you won't have any major train wrecks. If you're gonna, once you plant it though, you want it to die, okay? You want it to die, so you wanna be able to plan to have that sprayer there pretty close to the time of planting. I prefer after. It can be a day or two ahead of time, except I don't like extra tracks out there and, and knocking the residue against the way I'm planting and with other traffic. But, but right after is, is probably my preference in that situation. Um, and then uh, we've got to get it dead quick. So if we're using herbicides, especially like a translocating herbicide or something, we're going to have to have a little different strategy and you got to work with, if you don't spray yourself, you're going to have to work with your, your uh, uh, vendor that does your spraying. And you know, I sit down this time of year with them and, and every year, they've been doing it for, they, they help me every once in a while. I spray most of my own, but every once in a while I'm going to need them. So when I call them and I sit there and I ask them, I said, they get really mad at me. I said, what kind of nozzles do you have on your sprayer? They go, what do you mean? What kind of nozzles do we have? They've got those dial ones like that. I said, early in the year, I don't want you to th throw the, the low, low drift nozzles out there. It's going to be cooler. I want more droplets, more places. So I need to know what nozzles you've got on your sprayer. And I'm going to tell you which nozzles I want when I'm spraying burn down because I want it to die quick. I don't want those beans or corn to come up and see that green. Really? Remember what I just talked about? When they come up, they see that green, that, that spectrum, that reflection. It's actually the far red spectrum off of the, off the light scale that reflects off of other green material, and it triggers that plant to go into elongation, which will rob it from its, its uh, yield uh, you know, uh, potential. So, so anyway, I want, it to, I want to know what nozzles they've got. I'm going to have smaller droplets, more places. And early in the season like that, drift is a little less of an issue, maybe, we hope. Uh, but I'm not saying just fog it so that we get a lot of drift, but, but I don't want big, big globs of, of liquid going out there. I want, it, I want to get more droplets, more places. I would like to have several days above 50 degrees so that translocation is happening rapidly. Uh, I'd like to spray on a sunny day, if at all possible, uh, that, that's got temperatures over 55 degrees. Uh, and and I, I want them to stop spraying four hours before sunset. And that has to do with when photosynthesis stops early in the year. And, and so it, if it takes a couple hours for that product to get into the plant and get moving through the plant, it only does that when the plant is photosynthesizing, okay? And if so I need about four hours before sunset to assure that that got translocated through the plant, in, especially in cooler weather. That happens really fast in the summertime, so it's not as big a deal. But in this earlier, cooler spring, you're going to need more time to get that moving around. And then I don't like to see a lot of...
cold temperatures that follow the spray or precede the spray. And that's just something that you need to just have that discussion with if you're hiring that done or if you're doing it yourself, that, that this is a, a, new, a new thing. We're not killing chickweed that's going to die in two weeks anyway. We're, we're killing something that wants to live and has a really good re root system, but we want it dead pretty quickly, if at all possible. That's where I, the roller crimpers are actually a really good thing, because you come by and roller crimp that after you plant, it's down and it's probably going to start dying pretty quick. Okay. If you're using, you have to understand your water management. In the Midwest, we have hard water. A lot of calcium ions in there. A lot of people don't understand that in that, that we have to put the AMS, we have to buffer that water that's in the nurse tank. We can't, we can't uh, just put it in the sprayer tank and we've got AMS and we've got the water in the sprayer tank, uh, but the nurse tank water has not been buffered and we're using a, a, an induction system and putting our glyphosate in there. The glyphosate in the short distance in the hose and the plumbing between, between where it gets inducted to get in the tank, it can already react with those calcium ions and the res net result is you're, you're actually spraying with a third less of active product. Okay, so that's just something, put the AMS in the nurse tank. That's, that's something that doesn't, it isn't intuitive, you know, that that would happen that way, but it's a very fast reaction. Then, then I, I said, you know, keep your, keep your gallonage low, that keeps your, keeps your concentration up, up. Uh, no nozzles with really coarse spray droplets, and maybe keep your pressure up pretty good. And you're trying to get more, more droplets, more places. Understand an antagonism. A lot of the products that we put down uh, like have atrazine in them. Atrazine, how does atrazine kill? What's the mode of action? How does it kill? What's it do to the plant? shuts off photosynthesis, it's a photosynthesis inhibitor. What did I say about having really good active photosynthesis to make this system work, to make it translocate? If you've got a product that's working against photosynthesis in the mix, in the, in the spray solution, then it's gonna be counteractive for, for what you're trying to get done when you're trying to kill really big, actively growing, really healthy stuff, okay? It's different than killing chickweed that's going to die in two weeks anyway. Everybody's the champion when we're killing something that's going to die in two weeks anyway, right? Okay, so anything that burns, not, don't put a bunch of 28 with glyphosate. You can have maybe a gallon or something, but that really doesn't do you much good. Just, just leave things that burn out of the glyphosate because you want maximum photosynthesis. You, wanna, you want that plant to think it's healthy right up until... It has that circulated all the way through it, okay? So don't have something that shuts down photosynthesis, okay? And a lot of this is on, this is all work that, that was basically published on at ryegrasscovercrops.com. The, the Oregon Ryegrass Seed Commission put this out. Uh, Mike Plummer, one of our greatest uh, uh, advocates for cover crops and no-till, we, we lost him a couple years ago. Uh, unfortunately, a good friend to, to all of us in the conservation business, but but he put together most of this through a lot of the work that he did. He really spent a lot of time on really getting spray uh, solutions and technologies down to, to really get this burn down work. And, and he did this so that we could get annual ryegrass, which is a really good cover crop, killed. But some people have trouble because they don't follow these, these steps and guidelines. But, but if you follow these steps and guidelines, it, it dies pretty good. And this just shows antagonism. Anytime you see a product that's got the word extra or plus after it, be suspicious that it's got atrazine in it and it's going to counteract some of the, the translocating herbicide activity. Okay? Some products are actually uh, beneficial uh, that can work with them, but, but more likely than not, a lot of times the, the uh, glyphosate or, or products by themselves. Just make sure you've not got two products that are antagonistic to each other when you're trying to get this burn down to work. And then I talked about should you crimp. I would definitely have really big cereal rye. I would definitely crimp, if, especially if I've got corn that I'm planting in there. I want that, I want that rye down. I don't want corn to have to fight for sunlight. Uh, beans are a little more tolerant to that, but, but, but a lot of times we, we probably see more benefits than not of crimping. 
the only reason that, that some guys don't crimp like myself is if you've got a bird dog that you feed all year long that you'd really like to have some quail out there, that's extra cover for them. They seem to do better there, okay? But if you're not a bird hunter, then, then crimping has real advantages to get this cover crop down on the ground, make that mat, make those crops not have to fight for sunlight if they don't have to. Most of the soybeans do just fine on this, especially if you're running a drill where you've knocked down three-fourths of it anyway. Uh, but, but corn, like where I'm standing in that field, if I, if I had corn in that, I would want that on the ground, if at all possible. Even if I still used a herbicide, I'd want to knock that down. Okay. Strategically, for success, we've got to have a game plan, uh, but we've got to be a game time coach. Uh, one final thing, and I'm not probably going to spend a lot of time on this because I think it was very adequately covered this morning by our entomologist in the room, but, but, but have a different, in the spring like this, you know, in a wet spring when we've got a lot of extra biomass, people get really nervous about the insects. Let's not make it a habit of just automatically putting an insecticide in with our burn down herbicide. There's too many unintended consequences. So we want to still in, use in, true integrated pest management in this system. And a true integrated pest management utilizes holistic management, uh, limits pest opportunities, and that's mostly about crop rotations. Uh, it integrates predator prey. That was what I wanted to highlight as much as anything is understand, be as good at identifying beneficials as you are at, at identifying pests. That's the new thing. If you're going to be in this system, you've got to be as good at that as you are at scouting for pests. Okay? And so it employs a lot of different beneficial biology and cultural practices. Uh, Seldom would you be, would an integrated pest management system be based on uh, what I'd call preventative sprays. Well, I'm going to spray just in case because there's a lot of unintended consequences. And I think we've, we've fallen into that trap a lot because we've had a lot of easy buttons provided to us. But a lot of these are really good, important products that we don't want to lose the use of. We might need them for extreme situations, so we don't want to lose the use of them. So let's keep them available to us but by not overusing them and run the risk of having them taken away from us, okay? Because these are, you know, we, we've got to keep the biology out there, all of the biology working for us, if at all possible. So, uh, and then use technology and chemical treatments when necessary. So true integrated pest, pest management doesn't say never, use these, but, but let's use them judiciously so that, so that we, we, we can get the maximum out of this living ecosystem that we can, okay? And then slugs, I, I, that's been covered well enough today, I think. I think I'll just move on. I just want to show some pictures here. We get army worms almost every year. This is army worms. We had a, I, I converted a pasture, and you know it was a nice green lust pasture that I converted to cropland. For whatever reason, that attracted some army worm moths to come lay their eggs in there, and so it was just a, like a five-acre, maybe ten-acre area of the of the field. And I was watching it. I've, I scout all my fields, and sure enough, I saw army worms. And and if you did the count. It was, it, it was above the threshold where you would spray, but I kept looking everywhere. You know, I was looking around, and I'd see all these spiders. I'd see carabid beetles. I'd see soldier beetles, uh, minute pirate beetles. I mean, there were all these granddaddy, granddaddy long legs, and I kind of just kept watching it, kind of kept watching it, kept watching it, and I've, done, I've tried to do a pretty good job of helping the beneficials along and not having a lot of unintended consequences, so I watched it and watched it, and before very long... See that soldier beetle? Before long, all I could find was, see that carcass next to the, the beetle? I could find carcass, dead carcasses of, of army worms that the, the beneficials got them for me. I mean, it was just one of those things. And it was not a big enough area that I was going to panic, so I was just watching them. But just know that if you have a really healthy, robust population of those predators, sometimes they'll do the work for you. Okay, so that's just kind of a take-home message that follows up on our, our entomology talk this morning. Okay, slugs, same way. We've got we to have whatever wants to eat a slug. Slugs have been around a long time. I'm just seeing if you're still awake. I don't know. Is anybody still awake? Uh, they were bigger in the early days, as you can see. Um, 
But uh, so we think they're bad today. That would have been really bad, wouldn't it? Just, just get to know some of these resources. Uh, Farming with Beneficial Insects is one of my favorite ones. If you open that up. When I started uh, taking some of the, like the, the seed treatments, insecticides off of my soybeans, I still occasionally use them on some corn because I want every corn plant to come up. But I took them off of uh, uh, my soybeans because really most of the entomologists I talked to said, you really, unless you're, no, unless you're no-tilling into a manure situation, they're really not probably helping you. There's no seed corn maggots or anything like that. So when I did that, all of a sudden I started seeing a lot more lightning bugs and fireflies. And at the same time, I really I used to have a lot of slugs. I don't have slugs as a problem much anymore. I haven't haven't had in many years, but I do have at night. I see a lot of fireflies. And I, so I opened up this book and I looked. And I said, I like this book because it tells me what's the common prey of that beetle, that coleoptera family of beetles. What do they want to eat? <laughs> Their favorite prey. Slugs, caterpillars, all the bad things that I don't want there, they eat. That's what they want. So I sure don't want unintended consequence of knocking them out. Besides, I like seeing all the fireflies at night, you know, when my nieces and nephews come up and, and, and want to play out in the field and catch lightning bugs. That makes me feel good. So anyway, and we've, we've, we've covered most of this. So I'm going to... Oh, there is... There is a publication that a lot of the Midwest uh, entomologists went together on the effectiveness of neonicotinoid seed treatments on soybeans, and that's the first place I would take them off if it, was, if it were me, uh, just because there's not a lot of evidence that they're, they're benefiting us that much. Put that money into inoculants. You know, go ahead and inoculate your beans, especially after a year like last year. Put that money there instead, okay? So if we, if we do some of these things, some of these strategies, hopefully we'll get a more resilient cropping system. We'll get, a, get some of that function back to our soil so that if it rains two inches overnight, we don't have to sit in the coffee shop and say, what are you going to do? It rained two inches last night. You can go and you can say, I've restored soil function, and my, my soil took that two inches of rain and handled it just fine. And you get to brag a little bit, right? Everybody likes to brag a little bit every once in a while, okay? So let's be ready next season. Here's some resources. If you just Google NRCS Soil Health, we've got a lot of resources there, a lot of webinars, a lot of scientific uh, uh, interviews and farmer interviews. Uh, you might even find Dave Brandt on that, on, on that website someplace. Uh, and and uh, there's a lot of really good publications and resources and then a lot of other links to other good places. So I'll leave it there. Uh, I might have a time for a question or two. See, the after lunch. Now you're slipping back into unconsciousness and back, okay. I agree with you on your mixing chemicals. I last year got in a hurry. I wanted to get it done, put the glyphosate, atrazine, didn't kill my uh, uh, ryegrass, possibly 20 bushels per acre. Yeah, we have, a, we have a testimony up here that mixing chemistries together can be antagonistic and it have a bad outcome, but, but so, so mixing atrazine with, say, glyphosate or something like that can, can reduce, especially in cooler, wetter, less ideal conditions. What, what about a little bit of metribuzin? What about a little metribuzin? Metribuzin, it's still a trizine, right? It still is a, for whatever reason, it's a slower reaction. I've been able to mix metribuzin with glyphosate with less problematic outcomes. Atrazine seems to shut down photosynthesis a little quicker than metribuzin has. Has anybody else had that issue? Metribuzin seems to, seems to be something that I can mix uh, in there without, without as much trouble. Uh, I'm not saying it's not causing some, but if you do all the other things, you'd be amazed, like spraying in the middle of the day and getting really other parts of your spray water is really good.